Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jewelers webinar series sponsored by RDI Diamonds. Today's session is hosted by our senior editor, Brecken Branstrader, and features Wilkerson Vice President Josh Hayes and recently retired jeweler Jim Adair, the former owner of Adair Jewelers. Before I turn the discussion over to Brecken and her guests, I just want to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can drop it into the Zoom oh, Q&A box at the bottom of their screens. I'll be back on after the discussion to share any questions with our panelists. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Monday, August 9th. Now I'll turn it over to Brecken to get things started. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michelle. And welcome, of course, to Josh and Jim. I'm so happy to have you guys here with me today. Thank um, you. We are here. We're going to dive into a topic that's important for jewelers, which is, of course, exit strategies as they pertain to retirement or going to business sales. But before we do that, I wanted to help our listeners get sort of acquainted with you guys. So if you could give a brief introduction about your um, experience in the trade and how long um, you've been in jewelry, as well as a little bit about um, how you, when you guys work together, what you work together with. Um, start with you, Josh, you want to do that? Sure. I'm Josh Hay. I'm the vice president of Wilkerson. Uh, Wilkerson is a company that was founded in 1970. Um, I grew up in the business. My father and Mr. Wilkerson are partners, so I grew up as the box boy and everything else. Um, and I've put together over 500 of these events. Uh, Wilkerson's has done thousands, and this is this is what we do. This is our specialty. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, Jim. Well, uh, I've been in the jewelry business virtually forever. My first job in the business was cutting agates for wheelers out of Lemon, South Dakota, running the rock saws uh, roughly 45 years ago. We've had Adair Jewelers here in Missoula since 1982. So what's that? Roughly 39 years. Uh, I do have to clarify one point, though. I did run a retirement sale, but I'm not retired. We can't hire enough help to allow me not to be here. <laughs> And so we still got the store. We're still functioning. I'm still working every day, but I don't want to, <laughs> so, but I'm here. Okay. If we hire somebody, send me some people, we'll hire them and I can get out of here. Okay, great. And when did you run your retirement sale? And it was uh, just this last fall, this last Christmas. So roughly six months ago. Okay, great. Um, so let's jump into these two events a little bit. So Josh, I want to throw this first question to you. Um, let's start by talking about how these two events um, that we're going to cover retirement and going out of business closing sales might differ in terms of um, the way that they're handled. Sure. They're very different and very same, very similar at the same time. Um, when you're running a closing event, the focus is about the store owner's retirement, but the store is closing at the same time. Where the difference is, is a retirement event is store owner is intending to retire, but store is continuing on. Um, so that's the core difference. And how that affects the sale is the urgency of the event. Uh, the consumer's urgency to come in and buy something is dramatically different in a closing event compared to a retirement sale because the store will be continuing on in the retirement. So when you're talking about a closing event, you know, Wilkerson's current average is about 1.2 times annual sales. So if the store does a million dollars a year, we're going to average a million two to a million three in an eight, nine week time period. Where in a retirement sale with that lack of urgency, you, you cut that number in half. So you're looking at about a half to seven tenths of a year's worth of business. So it's a six, seven hundred thousand dollar event for that store. Still a great event, but dramatically different. Um, the advertising is the same forms of media are used, but the way it's represented is different. Um, you know, in a retirement sale, it's more of the transition that's taking place from owner to whoever's continuing it on or the celebration of that person, you know, who is retiring is leaving and there's farewell parties and things like that. Um, but there's a big stipulation of stores continuing on. We don't mm -hmm. want to give the perception of the stores closing when it's not. 
um, where in a closing sale, it's, you know, things like final countdowns are implemented five days left, four days left. If you want that item, you better get in and get it because the store is not going to be here. And that urgency doubles the volume. But besides that, there, there's a lot of similarities there. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a good segue. Let's talk about what is also the same between the two kinds of events. Uh, the way they're the same is really the forms of media. Um, you know, you have your big five, your newspaper, TV, radio, billboards, direct mail. Um, the media had, landscape has changed over the last 15 years to where now there's, I think we counted 25 different forms of media that we utilize in our events. Wow. Uh, we don't do all of them in every event. But you could, I mean, anything from your different forms of social media to a slide broadcasting, you know, direct text to customers, um, internet radio, it just from trucks, mobile trucks. Um, it's just the, the way that media is fragmented is incredible. Uh, and so those things are the, still done the same. The message is different, but the different forms of media don't change that much. The other thing that's similar to in the sales is the celebration of the store owner's retirement. Um, when you run a closing event, you don't want the storyline to be the store is closing and the event to come across as some sort of funeral for the store. Um, that's the last thing you want. Jewelry is an upbeat purchase. It's a celebration by things like that. And so when you do this, you want it to be a celebration. And so when you're running a closing sale, it's still the celebration of the store owner retiring, farewell parties, things like that. It's just when you're doing a retirement and the store's continuing on, you add in the transition of who is taking over and, and go from there. Okay, that makes sense. So if you were talking to a jeweler who was thinking about, you know, sort of in the early stages of either of these events, um, what would you say is like one of the most important things that they should consider or think about as they're going into the process? It's the biggest thing that changes your dollar amount that a person is going to take home at the end of the day from this sort of transitional event is inventory management. Um, so people who call us with plenty of time, um, it, we can help you manage more of your inventory into the categories that you're going to sell more of during the event, lower inventory, say we might run projections and look at it and say, you're about 150,000 over inventory compared to where you need to be uh, in this to get to maximize your returns. So let's spend the next 18 months reducing certain categories, you know, to get you to that perfect position. Um, it could be categories of inventory. Things like bridal in these events are actually your slowest category during a sale. Uh, the reason for that is when a person is running events, say Jim is running his event, a gentleman's not going to wake up one day and say, oh, Jim's retiring. I better go find a girl and get engaged. Um, it's a time sensitive purchase. And right. so for the people who are in that window and looking for it during that time frame, you have that business and you'll see an increase of it because you'll get a bigger market grab. But it's that percentage in that category is not going to go up exponentially as it will of, you know, diamond fashion, color fashion, earrings, pendants, bracelets, something can, that somebody can just wake up and go buy on a Tuesday because Mr. Jeweler is retiring. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you've started working with a jeweler, you know, if I was to ask you what your first step would be with them, is it along the same lines, inventory management and sort of getting that into place? The first step is, is information gathering. Um, we have a two page questionnaire that we send to the store owner uh, and it just goes through and basically gives us their business model. When someone says I have a jewelry store, that can be 20 different business models from discounter to guild to custom you know, repair shop, you know, there's so many different formats that a store can be. So we'll get these forms from them. And every event that you do, it has to be custom built to each store, each situation, mm -hmm. type of goods that they sell. Um, and so first step is always fact finding, getting the information, how long have they been in business? What's the square footage of the store? You know, what categories are, do they specialize in? Are they a bridal store or fashion 
predominantly. Um, and then we build the model from there uh, around that store and location and area. Gotcha. Okay. So Jim, I'm going to throw you a similar question to what I asked Josh, which is from your perspective, from the retailer's perspective, um, what's one big thing that you would tell jewelers before they went into a retirement sale? Today? Preparation. Um, you know, Wilkerson's is going to show up with the marketing, um, uh, the, the, the structure that they have, they're going to bring into your store this framework, this outside framework to run the sale, to help you do business. But you as a jeweler have to have your inventory squared away so that you can maximize the business that you do from your side. As an example, um, it doesn't matter if you have five pair of amethyst earrings or 50 pair of amethyst earrings or 200 pair of amethyst earrings to start the sale. It won't be enough. You're going to run out. But there's other things. You, you have to be a numbers geek. You have to go through your last five years sales projections. If you have the edge, you can pull up all your categories. You can look at your price points. You can see exactly what you have to have, what you've sold. And then you can project it based on the numbers that Wilkerson's gives you as far as what they project your sale is going to produce. Then you can go back and run the numbers backwards and say, okay, I'm going to do $1.5 million. Because of that, it's going to be X percentage of this and that category. And then you've got to make sure you have that kind of inventory on hand to run the sale. Uh, you might have it sitting there in a drawer. Who knows? Uh -huh. But you don't want anything sitting in a drawer when the sale starts. You want it outpriced in a box. The other thing that I believe is the single biggest thing you can do to help yourself and help the sale is that go through every single item you've had in your store. Uh, if you're doing a retirement sale or a GOB, you've obviously been in business long enough to acquire um, safe queens where you've had something sitting around for five years, 10 years, 15 years, maybe 20 years. OK, you might have it based on four, four or five hundred dollar an ounce gold. Well, you're crazy to go ahead and put that out in your showcase discount at 50, 60, 70 percent because you're going to be selling it for less than what the scrap is worth. So you need to go through, assess every single item that you have, make sure it's priced to current prices, make sure that it's clean, make sure, if it, you know, sterling silver. The last thing you want to have is a bunch of tarnished merchandise that's been sitting there for five years. Polish it, clean it, dip it, whatever. Get it saleable, get it in a box. Do the prep work, get your inventory ready, and the sale goes so much easier because remember something. The sales are basically what we call snap and goes. Somebody walks in and says, you want this one, you want that one, snap the box closed, go write it up, you're out of here. A regular, normal course of business, people ponder, they go through a lot of different ramifications of finding out whether they want something. In this, it's price. It's price driven. It's mm -hmm. the deal. It's the sale. It's the marketing has pulled them into your store to buy something they're excited. Most of the transactions are fairly fast. So your merchandise has to be ready to go out the door very fast. Right. Okay. So tell There's me about your, oh, sorry, go ahead, Josh. Sorry. There's, I, I agree with you. There's a lot less of you know what we i guess we call romancing the stone yeah. and that's why one of the steps of this process is you know the jewelry industry is known for hiding the price tag uh you have to ask you know a representative from the store well how much is this one that's impossible in a sale event because you have a store full of customers and so you you have to go through and not rebox everything we want everything nicely displayed in in the way that the customers are used to seeing it but you'll put a sale price you know on the front of the display to where the customers can walk through and see the item you don't have time to go through and tell them every one of them and romance it and well how much is this one? that one minus 30 percent you know, and adjust it every time. Right. Okay. Um, so Jim, tell me a little bit about why you wanted, why you made the decision to hire a company like Wilkerson um, to help you in the process and what you think that having them as a partner helped you do with that. Well, I guess it's several items. First of all, I've always been a marketing guy. I've always been a merchandising guy. I am a crappy bookwork guy. I admit it cheerfully. Um, the main thing is this. I knew that I have, with a retirement sale, one shot. Obviously, with a GOB, 
you get another shot if you do that. But there's four main sales that you have in the life of a store, a grand opening, uh, some sort of a, a moving sale, or you go to a bigger location, whatever. And then the two at the end, you don't get a do over. So I was not willing to risk hundreds of thousands of dollars on my ability to throw together everything in the marketing that these guys do every single cotton pick and day. They're going to be state of the art. I'm not. I'm a jeweler. I don't deal with all this other stuff in the marketing aspect that they do. So I needed to do the things that I do and let them bring the things that they do. So I looked at several different companies on what they actually bring to the table. And for me, it was relatively simple. I went with Wilkerson's because they were extremely highly recommended from other jewelers that I've spent years traveling to Belgium with to buy diamonds. Um, their reputation is great. Other guys have great reputations. But what Wilkerson's brings to the table is the marketing plan that I think is absolutely unbeatable. And it Panned out well, we ran somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% above our top level projections for the sale. So it worked. Yeah. So what we all did, it worked. Safe to say you would recommend to other jewelers to look for help as well. Unquestionably. They- and here's the point. Most jewelers are primarily jewelers. Mm-hmm. Then they might do marketing, book work, whatever. They have other jobs that go along being a jewelry store operator. But their strong point is being a jeweler, not a marketing person who's up on everything that's going on in the world. So why risk? Let these guys do their job, pay them their fee, let the pros come in, it's set up for you, and you do your job that you do best. Deal with your customers. You don't have to, you don't have the time to be sitting there adjusting every day as they're adjusting the sales and they're adjusting the promotion as we go along and, and different things that they do. No, you got to deal with doing business. At that point in time, do your job, let them do their job, and you'll make more money. And that's really why we we all look at this. We want to put as much money in the coffers as we can. And so my attitude was let the let them do their job. I'll do my job and it works. Right. So you talked about marketing and Josh, you mentioned this a little bit at the beginning too, the different kinds of media. So I wanted to sort of go back to that. And, you know, obviously marketing is a huge part of these sales. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what differs in the marketing strategies for these events, you know, how you recommend jewelers pivoting um, platforms and that kind of thing. You know, yes. And it's, it's tricky because like I said, there's so many different forms of media out there and every location in every area has different strengths in media a newspaper is still strong in florida it's completely useless in the rest of the country but florida i guess because of the higher retirement age it's it's still viable there um you know these forms of media that we're always going to use uh direct mail is still incredibly strong even if a customer doesn't have a mailing list anymore the way that you can buy a list now, it's scary how specific and how good they've gotten them because of these data companies have so much info. You know, used to, you just kind of had to, you know, spray out in every door direct mailer and hope for the best. Um, it's It really is scary, the data that's out there now. And it doesn't really cost any, cost much to be able to build a um, mailing list specific to the location, the area, the demographic, you know, income housing region that you want. Uh, the other one is social media. It's, it's a no brainer and it's highly effective because it's inexpensive. Yeah. Um, you're not going to do the huge amounts of business that you will off of some of the other forms of media, like the billboards and, and the direct mail, things like that. But what you will get is, I believe it's one or two in the return on investment for the advertising dollar spent, because boosting an ad is $10, $20 uh, to get it out to 10,000 people. And so the return on investment of that advertising dollar is huge compared to the expensive billboards and all the other forms of media. Uh, Where the world is changing is things like sign trucks, uh, billboards, 
are going by the wayside. Local communities, uh, they call them beautification committees, or, or is what they like to say. Um, everyone's trying to do away with billboards in local areas. Uh, so they allow you to keep your old billboard, but you can't maintain it. And when it falls down, it's done type of deal. And over time, they're trying to age them. So now the world's turned to mobile sign trucks, um, you know, just everything imaginable to be able to work around that or buses, you know, getting on the sides of buses. Uh, Geofencing is something we're really using now. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's where um, you can, it's, it's scary what you can do anymore. I'll say that again, but I can create a digital fence around the store or around the store's competitors, or just say around the town. Um, if it's a smaller region and anybody who walks into that region, into that zone, that fence that we've created, their IP address is captured. And when they open the weather channel app or sports center or whatever app it is, they're going to start seeing ads for the sale event and you're able to track them for a certain period of time. I believe it's up to six months um, and they'll see the ad. And so the world is changing. The forms of media are changing. And, um, you know, I said earlier that to answer your original question, when you're talking about a retirement or a closing event, the urgency changes mm -hmm. um, and the way the ad looks based on creating urgency is different, but they're very similar other than that. So, if one, oh, sorry, oh, wait, one point, if I could add to that, um, for many, many years, I did TV and radio and I was, I walk into a grocery store and I'm, mom, mom, that's a diamond guy on TV. I heard that for years. TV and radio have ceased to be as important as these other forms that Josh is talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just totally radically changed. And that's one thing that Wilkerson's has that. I was just so impressed with is that they're up on these things where those of us that are day in and day out working in the trenches might not be exposed to. And that's the value of what they bring to the table. Yeah. So are you targeting um, sort of similar audiences when you uh, are promoting these events or do you tend to go to a broader group of people? Uh, both. To okay. do over a year's worth of sales in eight weeks, um, it takes the store owner's previous customer base, people who have been through the door, who have gone into the store, whether they bought or not. That's generally accounts for about 35 to 40 percent of the volume of an event is past customers. Um, but 65 you know, percent or so of the volume is done by new customers, mm -hmm. uh, people who have never been in the store before. And you know, some of them are what we call sale shoppers. There are people who are just there for the discount. Um, my wife is a big sale shopper. She loves it. It's, it's a game to her. And I tell her, I'm like, hon, I, I, I'm in this business, you know, just go by what you like. And I finally figured out it's not about that. It's about the entertainment factor of it. She enjoys the thought of feeling like she got a deal. Right. Um, and so a large percentage of them are those. And so to capture those customers, it's the media just has to go out to a broader audience, not just the customers or pre-existing client base. Right. Okay. And then you mentioned along those lines, you know, sort of the idea of creating urgency for these events as well. But then there's also going back to, you don't want to make it seem like a funeral for the, for the store. Yeah. So how do you sort of bridge those when it comes to the messaging that you are sending out for the marketing? It's tricky because you want to create that urgency, but you have to create the celebration of the retirement. Uh, we'll put a big sign, a, a frame style sign on the wall that the customers will do a farewell message to the store owner for his retirement. Uh, we'll have farewell parties. You really just have to make sure in your wording that it's a celebration. And, and that's something a lot of jewelry store owners are worried about when I have initial conversations with them. You know, all they see is these big box stores like Toys R Us and things like that that are closing. And it just says going out of business. Everything must go. It's a real doom and gloom. You know, come in and pick the bones of this store type of deal. 
And, you, you know, but that's what they're accustomed to seeing driving home every day. Mm-hmm. And so we really have to show them samples of ads and kind of what we do and say, you know, that might work when you're buying shoes or hardware or shovels or things like that. But that's not how it works in jewelry. You know, people don't want to buy jewelry at a funeral. It's a party. It's a celebration. It has to be an upbeat atmosphere. And so that's really where our focus is. Okay. And then going back to um, sort of inventory management, I suppose, I, I wanted to ask this question as well about when it was necessary. I guess how often did, does this have to happen? But when is it necessary to bring in additional inventory for the sale? I mean, Jim, you also mentioned, you know, if you're going to have enough for this kind of thing. But talk me through when, when that's needed and what the process is for that. Sure. The, well, uh, oh, go ahead, Josh. All right. Um, the primary goal of the event is we have to sell the store owner's merchandise. You know, mm-hmm. that's the intent of it is they've built up this collection of inventory over their career. And now we need to cash it out for them to be able to go home and have their nest egg. If we don't sell it during the event, they're looking at selling it off to a closeout company um, for a percentage on the dollar or just melting it and scrapping it and breaking it out. So we, we really want, that has got to be the number one focus. Um, you know, when you talk about additional merchandise, it, it, it is a double-edged sword, I guess is the best way of putting it. You know, when you're talking about doing a year's worth of business in a short amount of time, a lot of store owners don't have the amount of inventory to be able to facilitate that. So what you do is you start the event off predominantly with all of the uh, owner's inventory because you don't want to load up with a lot of filling merchandise at the start and then have those goods compete with each other. Right. So as the sale progresses, so you get to week two, three, say week four, you've done half a year's worth of volume. You're going to start seeing holes develop there Mm -hmm. and you run out of diamond studs you're not going to be able to flip that customer to a sapphire pendant, a person that walks in wanting a pair of studs, they want a pair of studs. So as those holes develop, that's when you want to fill in those categories with additional merchandise to where you're refueling those categories, but it's not competing with the own goods at the same time. I see. Okay. Um, Jim, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I guess I was a bit of an anomaly. I'm kind of an inventory piggy. So I had a lot of goods here. I, I had the cases full. Um, they were probably kind of disappointed in me because I didn't sell a whole lot of their goods. Um, <laughs> that's just the way it worked out. We were ready. But here's the thing that I believe. The vast majority of stores out there have a lot of merchandise, whether it's loose stones, whether it's... Uh, mountings, whatever that's sitting, mount it up, mount your goods up, get it out, get it in the showcase. The thing is that I was happy with is we were horrible on gold chains. I didn't have them. My, my people, uh, Bill and Alice McDonald, they built me a chain wall. So we had a whole doggone wall full of chains. Um, there's a lot of things we didn't need that they had that they brought. We didn't need them, but on the categories that we did need, man, they stepped up and they had the merchandise. And here's one of the things that I know is very important. And that is Wilkerson's has deep pockets. So if you need a bunch of chains, they can make a phone call, it'll be here. If you need diamond earrings, they can make a phone call, it'll be here. Um, I don't know that everybody else has that capability, but that is one of the things that you need to look at when you're potentially uh, mentally interviewing these companies for these kind of sales. Do they have the capacity to supplement your inventory with their inventory when you need it on a quick, immediate type basis? Because I'll give you an example. Uh, we did, I think, 150, 160,000 the first day. Well, that's a lot of, that's a lot of inventory just whoop, gone. Well, there's some things, if you don't have a lot of it sitting there, you might be hurting within a day or two. Um, If they can't fill it quick, you're going to miss sales. And you're better off getting a chunk of money from one of their pieces than you are having the customer walk. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of it for us is we didn't need a lot of it. But in what we did need, 
they really stepped it up and filled us up in a hurry. And that's a big thing. We're not there to push our merchandise upon the store owner. It's, it's right. there to supplement when it's needed, if it's needed for the client. Right. That's what they did. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, before I turn it over to Michelle, because I think that's all the questions I had, but I wanted to make sure that we, before we jump to audience Q&A that um, we had touched on anything. So before we jump to there, is there are there any other points you guys want to cover? Um, any other notes? I know, Jim, you wanted to make sure we talked about the prep of the store and you did that, so I, but I just want to make sure we've got everything covered. Otherwise, I'll toss it to Michelle. There was something that Jim mentioned, if you don't mind, I want to just uh, extend a little bit on um, <laughs> something that is time consuming for store owners and they need to plan ahead is uh, getting all of the loose, getting everything to a finished state. Yeah. Um, when you're planning an event like this, if it's not into a finished state, you're not going to sell it. Um, you know, now maybe some loose solitaires, it's fine, the bigger stuff, but all of your loose melee, your colored stones, you know, every jeweler has built up a safe full of that stuff over the years. You save it, you build a custom piece with it, you, you know, use a stone here or there for repair. Well, if you don't sell, sell it during the event, what are you going to do with it? Um, right. Sell it for pennies on the dollar back to the industry. If, he, if you can find a buyer for it, um, you've got to get to, to a finished state. People will take colored stones and put them in just four prong silver pendants and grandmothers will buy it for grandkids for birthstones. You know, just get work on a long time out because it takes a while, um, but work on getting those goods into a finished state before the event and you'll be amazed at the additional dollars that you can put in your pocket. Uh, the trick to it is don't increase your cost of goods dramatically buying tons of heavy mountings and everything for this, you know, inexpensive semi-precious stone to go into. Um, but get it to a finished state in the least expensive way possible. You'll be shocked the additional dollars that'll go into your pocket. That, those are great points. Is that because, is that purely sort of a speed thing? You talked about, you know, sort of how quickly things go and people aren't going to look at a stone and say, okay, I want to figure out a whole project to do with this now. They just want what they can buy at that point. It, it, the sale is focused on what is in the showcase because that is where they feel like the value is mm -hmm. and they're going to get a deal. Um, and so, yes, you'll do some custom work during a sale because, say Jim's got an old friend that says, Hey, before I retire, before you retire, I did kind of want to get this made for my wife. You'll do a little bit of it, but your general customers are not going to come in with custom mindset like they might in everyday business because mm -hmm. they know the sale is structured around the deals and the cases. Gotcha. Okay. It's Thank one you. other factor. You have to remember this sale, this type of sale is totally geared toward impulse. When you start, well, this colored stone might fit in this mounting or this or that, you take away the whole impulse factor. Right. You got a, a, a pendant sitting there. It's a $500 pendant. It's on sale for 199 bucks. It's in a box. It's ready to go. That's you want it or don't you? I mean, that's you got your total complete impulse right there and it's finished. Close the box. There you go. Write it up. If you've got to be, well, can your goldsmith get to it? Can he maybe get it set in time? Can he order a mounting? No, no, you don't, you don't want to be doing that. You, right. you destroy everything that your marketing has done to get people in the store and impulse. You're throwing it all away. Mount it up, get it there, get it ready to go. Josh is absolutely right. Okay, great. Thank you for that addition. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Michelle unless there's anything else just to see what um, questions we had from the audience and make sure we get to those too. Uh, thanks so much, Breck and Josh and Jim. That was a really informative, informative discussion. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to give our listeners a little bit more time to enter questions, any questions they might have. Again, that Zoom Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. And in the meantime, I'd just like to say a quick word about RDI Diamonds. RDI Diamonds, the selection you want, the quality you need. Thousands of diamonds, that's just the beginning. RDI offers a wide range of services and support to help you succeed, from flexible memo options, memo options, a partnership with the Beers Group Industry Services, to generous stock options and cost-efficient shipping. RDI's goal is to provide the highest quality of both care and diamonds to your store. Visit rdidiamonds.com today to learn more. That is rdidiamonds.com. 
Now let's get started with our listener questions. Uh, we had a couple come in beforehand and I wanna ask this one and I'm gonna actually direct this one to Jim. And Jim, my apologies as for introducing you as retired when you're not retired. Um, <laughs> I wish I was. <laughs> so I mended it in the chat to wishes to be retired. Um, there you go. So um, do you have any, one of the listeners wants to know, do you have any advice for a business owner who's retiring after near, nearly 40 years and selling the business to a longtime employee? And then there's a, a, another question also related to retirement. Yes, I, I would say a couple things. Um, first of all, when you do your sale, you have to make darn sure that you have an updated mailing list, uh, email list, uh, cell phone list, because a lot of the contacts will be made that way, number one. But number two, Josh touched on it a little bit where it's a celebration. If you're selling the store, or turning the store over to an employee that's been there forever, obviously that employee already has contacts with and relationships built up with many of the existing clients. So the celebration aspect of it, that the let's have fun, let's send, you know, the old guy off into the sunset riding the white horse with happiness. Uh, it's going to be a fun event, not a sad event. And you and know what? Course, That's the ultimate deal. Right. Emphasizing that the business is going to continue. And hey, longtime employee Bob is going to take over here. You know, please keep coming back. Yes. And, and one of the things to remember is that you're clearing out the vaults. You've got 40 years worth of accumulated merchandise stashed back in corners. You're going to clear them out. You're going to clean it out. You're going to get everything. We've got many little things we've stashed back through the years. This is your chance to get these one-of-a-kind items. Uh, Jim's clearing out his personal collection. You know, these are all things that you can do that just fit in with the whole marketing element. And, and you couldn't ask for better to go ahead and have it to a longtime employee. That's just the ultimate transition. It really is. That That's just a wonderful thing to be able to do. And Josh, anything to add to that? No, no, Jim explained it well. Okay. All right. Now someone else wants to know, and this is more of a personal question. When does one know when it's time to retire? And I think that's actually a, a really good question that a lot of people in this industry grapple with, because it's obviously like for a lot of people, it's not just a job, it's a passion. So how do you know when it's time to kind of say, you know, I've had enough, I want to move on and do this or do that. Um, Jim, what was kind of your thought process in deciding you were kind of coming to the end of your full-time working days? Well, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll answer that kind of with a couple of personal notes. Um, I had the store at first uh, 17 years in a mall. That was seven days a week. Uh, obviously we're open. Then I had a freestanding store for 20 years, a uh, 6,000 foot store that we built. And then this last one is bridal center that we built where we have big jewelry store. And then on one side, the other side, we have a big uh, bridal gown store. So I've gone through three different transitions there. Um, the mistake that I made is that for many, many years, it was six and seven days a week. And for the last 20 plus years, it's been six days a week one uh, two week vacation in there and that's it. And I got to the point where I personally was feeling a little bit burned out. Um, just, uh, I gotta do what? You know, there, there just gets to be a point in time where you just kind of feel it's time to go. Um, the other thing is this, you don't want to lose your zeal for the jewelry business. I've always been a rock geek. I still want to do that. But I don't want to have to deal with dirty, cruddy watches and changing watch batteries anymore. <laughs> um, that's just the way I, I'm done. I'm done. And so at some point in time when you feel that, it's it's good to get out before it's bad. Uh, you Go you out want on to top. start Go the transition. Top. Right. Absolutely. Go out Absolutely. When, when you still have some passion for it. Absolutely. You don't want to be a burned out old wreck or or. I'll give you another example. Uh, what about a GOB and somebody's maybe, I'll use the word 75 years old and they have three rings left in the showcase. They don't have any capability of getting more. They don't have anything left. They're tired. Nobody wants to come in the store, blah, blah, blah. The, the displays are old. At that point in time, just get out. 
get out while the getting's good. Don't beat a dead horse. Don't run it down to the point that there's nothing there. You have to be able to go ahead and transition onto the rest of your life, whether it's fishing or drinking beer or golfing or just sitting at your house, looking at the lot, uh, grass grow, uh, whatever it is, you want to be able to do that while you can still enjoy it. And you're not just totally burned out on everything. All of that sounds that help? Yeah, all of that sounds appealing, by the way. Um, do you Josh, mind the beer part? Yeah, <laughs> the, the beer part, especially. Yes, yes. I mean, it is five o'clock okay. somewhere, right? Um, yep. jo Josh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to throw it to you next. You've worked with a ton of jewelers. What What would you say to, in answer to this question? Yes, and it's it's tricky. Um, that's a great question, but it's hard to answer. Um, you know, when we work with store owners, I'll tell them, look, I can't tell you when to retire. It's just my job to figure out how to maximize it when you're ready. Um, but the big thing is, is that a lot of store owners that I do see stay too long. Um, they really actually retired four or five years ago. They just didn't leave the store. Um, and in today's world and how competitive it is, you have to be on your game 24 seven. And so you can't be complacent in the jewelry industry today when the margins have been reduced from what they were in the good old days. Um, you know, my father likes to say, you know, years ago, we could make five mistakes a day and it didn't really matter. Life was good. Um, now in our current world that we live in and the competitiveness, you can't do that. And so what I just don't like to see is people who have got burned out, become complacent, stayed too long, volume starts going down, mailing list isn't what it used to be, uh, and the store deteriorates and it affects the sale in the long run. Now, one thing I, I mean, do, I would guess it also affects the owner's mental health. Like you absolutely. don't, you don't want to enter into retirement feeling like you've been through the ringer for the last 10 years, yeah. five years, whatever. Um, a big thing that we work with store owners on, there are some that do, they retire and they close their store and just cold turkey. I mean, they go play golf and they fish and they do whatever it is they want to do. They're done. Uh, the majority don't want to do that. Uh, they want to stay in the industry in some capacity. And so I would say more than the latter, you know, what they want to do is get rid of the headaches. You know, a retail store is like a child that never grows up. It's something that you have to <laughs> work on 24 seven, you're thinking about it at night, during the day, always employee issues, inventory management, bills to pay. It's something that weighs on you at all times. And that is usually where the burnout factor comes from. It's just that constant stress. They just want to be able to go on a vacation and for a week or two and not worry about is the store going to be in decent shape when I get back. And so what ends up happening is a lot of people run a closing sale, close their store and transition into a buy appointment, personal jeweler, three days a week, you know, office setup. That way they have the ability to stay within the industry, do what they enjoy, but do it on their terms, no overhead, no stress. You know, what you'll do there is after you run the closing event, you still own your mailing list and, and generally actually we've cleaned up your list and it's going to be better added names to it. And most of them will take 60, 90 days off, you know, rest, recuperate, recharge the batteries, find them a little office space with take one of their showcases, get a brass and glass, a sample line, and then do a nice letter out to their customers announcing that, look, I'm loving retirement, but I also love what I do. And so I'm going to be working by appointment as your personal jeweler, um, you know, and some sort of nice letter that way to them. And that way you can stay within the industry. You'll do as much business as you want to do, to be honest with you. Most of them are super excited that now they've got a personal jeweler and they're going to, without you having overhead, now they'll feel like they'll be able to get a better deal than they even could in the retail atmosphere. And so a ton of jewelers do that. They don't just close up and, you know, fish seven days a week. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Um, we have a question that came in just now. How has uh, COVID affected these sales? 
And Josh, that's probably more of a question for you, general overview. Sure. Um, I'll tell you, it's, it's actually been good. Uh, now, if you'd asked me last April and May, I was losing sleep, just like everybody else. Didn't know what was going to happen. We had 25 sales running at Mother's Day and had to close every one of them down, shut them down where they were and wait. Uh, some of those events transitioned to the fall at Christmas. Some of them had leases that had to, that, you know, in July and August ending, they had to be out of the location. And so we started getting sales slowly, you know, back running again, a few here or there um, in late June, early July. And I was scared to death. I, I didn't know. I have no model for what was going on and what to expect. And so when those events fired back up, we were looking, all right, what do we anticipate? Are they going to do 60% of what our expectation was? 30%, 75%, what's it going to be? And I'm pleased, happy to say that the sales didn't lose any volume. They actually gained. Um, now there's a lot of structural things that are changed, capacity issues and stores, plexiglass, uh, cleaning jewelry, you know, now instead of having a showroom full of people, we have a showroom at the 15 person capacity or whatever it is, depending on the percentage of fire code. And you have a line out the door and around the block. Uh, it's crazy, but the overall volume hasn't changed. It actually went up a couple points from what we were trending pre COVID. So that's good, which, it, it, and that shouldn't be too shocking now when everyone's looking back because it, you know, regular sales in stores is, is incredible with all the money that's out there right now. And the sales were affected the same way. Uh, quick question before we move on. You obviously you had to, you know, there were limit capacity, social distancing was being enforced. Did you then say, okay, instead of a three day sale, we're going to make this a five day sale? Yes. Okay. It was five yeah. and seven. Um, you know, the trends, we were stretching everything out. Yeah. It's interesting because we've talked to a lot of jewelers about events during the pandemic. And they said that actually a lot of their customers like things to be less crowded. And they kind of, a lot of them switched to these kind of smaller invite only parties for the holidays. And they said that they feel like they just did as well with sales because the people that came were serious about buying and they, you know, weren't in there getting elbowed and packed in. They liked the less crowded atmosphere. It was more relaxed. And just yeah. that's not a going out of business sale. I'm just speaking about a general kind of holiday party type of event, but that's what sure. jewelers have told us. It was a big transition because, you know, our model is to get as many people in that store at one time as we can and create a feeding frenzy. Um, and, and that's what works. And so it was a huge variation, uh, but it's been successful in the end. I mean, from selling on social media, you know, we would have deals of the day um, and lots of stuff, Zoom parties uh, included into the event uh, and people would pull up to the front of the store and we'd walk out and hand them their bag. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of transition, but it's, it's been successful overall. Well, that's wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. Um, we have another question here that just came in. Uh, someone wants to know the average ad expense uh, for average ad expense for these total sale events uh, and um, the typical net margin at the end of most events. Okay. The um, advertising, the average is about 6%. Uh, of the volume that you do during the event. And that's how we like to set up the budget. Uh, I don't want to, you know, go to a store owner and say, hey, let's spend 50,000 on media for your sale or 25 or 75, uh, making a number out of thin air. You know, we run our projections, put together our projections based on previous stores, store owners volume, and what our sales are currently trending. So when someone fills out that little two page questionnaire that we talked about earlier, finding, getting the data on the store, the business model, I take their information and I look at similar stores, similar situations, current economy, what we did in other stores like those and come up with a trend. Uh, and then I'll have a conservative estimate and average and an aggressive range. And that tells me where I feel comfortable that we're gonna fall volume with these events. And so even then, it, our numbers are incredibly accurate. I don't have a crystal ball to tell 
tell me or tell the store owner, we're going to do exactly $1,276,000 in this event. And so we feel more comfortable setting the ad budget as a percentage of the volume of the event than we do a flat dollar amount. So I'll tell the store owner a 6% advertising budget is what we're recommending for this sale. We'll base the initial wave of media to get the sale up and running off of the projections. But then once the sale is up and running 10 days, then we have a trend and we feel a lot more comfortable. We know exactly where the sale is going to end up volume wise and we adjust the budget accordingly there. Okay. If I could on that. Oh, um, yes. Please, Jim. Because you, you're talking theoretical, Josh. Now, in my case, I can give you exacts of what actually happened. And one of the problems that a lot of people have when they first get their projection sheets from you folks is you look at it and say, okay, a million and a half dollars, six percent, that's 90 grand. Holy crap, 90 grand on advertising for two and a half months? That's insane. Well, it's still only six percent. Okay. On my sale, when it was all said and done, they were a couple hundred bucks below 6%. So they, when when you say 6%, Josh, you guys hit it dead on. Okay. And the thing is this, I would say this to all the other jewelers. Don't look at, if they project you out for a million and a half, don't look at, oh my God, 90 grand, that's insane. No, don't look at that. Look at the percentages. Because you have to be looking at this sale as doing three quarters of a year or a year, a year and a half's worth of business, the same way you look at a PL at the end of the year. What is your percentage that you spent on advertising for the year? Okay, you have to look at this that way with percentages. And if you do, all I can tell you is this um, I kind of looked at that 90 grand and went, whoa, but they hit it dead on and they were a couple hundred bucks under. So I'm going to say thank you not complain. <laughs> it's uh, it, when you talk about exasperating everything to a year, I was on the phone with a store owner last night and we were talking about ring sizings and I had on the projection estimated income from ring sizings and number of jobs. I said, how are we going to, you know, how would we make that much? She said, you have to think of everything on terms of you're going to do this amount of volume in a year's plus worth of volume in eight weeks. So that comes with it. Mm -hmm. We know 39% of the items sold are rings. If 80% of those have to be sized, think of the jobs. And then you exacerbate that also to ring boxes, pendant boxes, you know, oh, yes. bags, everything. It, it, when you're talking about doing a year's worth of business in eight weeks, it's not just ringing the register with a year's worth of volume. Everything else that you deal with in a daily basis comes along with that from a year crammed into a short amount of time. Well, let's talk about ring boxes, jewelry boxes. We went through, I want to say 15 gross of boxes at our sale. Wow. That's a hell of a lot of boxes. That's we a sold over a thousand pieces of uh, turquoise jewelry mm -hmm. at our sale. That's a lot of pieces. Well, the whole thing is we planned out in advance because you, you just can't get a shipment of 15 gross of boxes in one day. So we planned out in advance to have them come in periodically. And we stockpiled and rat hold all these boxes and we were ready. But the whole thing is you have to look at a year's worth of boxes are going to go out the door. You got to have them. You can't be sitting there halfway through the sale trying to get another half dozen gross boxes in. You can't do that. You have to have it done and planned in advance. If you do, you're not worrying about it. You're just putting more stuff out in the boxes, put in a showcase. You're good to go. Right. You but just, you got to I mean, have them there. Right. I, I think this message has come through a couple of times in this webinar. You just got to be focused on sale, like selling it, getting people to say yes, ringing it up and getting it out the door. Yes. You can't be getting tripped up on technicalities and details and stuff like that. If, um, if, you're, if you're in the back planning the next phase of media, if the store owner's doing that or the store owner's in the back trying to order additional ring boxes from Rocket Box or whoever it is, they're not selling. Right. And so that's right. why it's our job. We have a supply warehouse across the street from, from me right here that's full of ring boxes, pendant boxes, trays, uh, bags, everything imaginable. So when the store owner runs low, the consultant will call us and say, hey, I need 20 more dozen ring boxes. 
they're overnighted to you. You have them. Um, whatever you don't use at the end of the sale, you ship back. You know, we're not in the box business. We don't make a profit on it, but we, it's something that's a necessity for the success of these sales. Anything that takes the store owner's mind off of selling to focus on something else is something that we should be taking care of and they're losing money if they're doing it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Josh, really quickly, we're almost out of time here, but I do want to get to the second part of this question, which is what are the typical net margins at most of these events? Okay. Um, and that is very hard to answer. Okay. Um, I will tell you to answer the question, Wilkerson's overall average for a store, store owner on their merchandise at the end of the day, after the sale expenses are paid and everything, is about a dollar twenty-five to dollar twenty-seven back on the cost dollar. So if you had, you know, a half a million worth of goods, that means you're going to walk away with seven hundred thousand uh, at the end of the day after everything's paid. The trick to that is, though, is that is a number that is heavily skewed. Um, it can be anything from a dollar ten to two twenty-five return on the dollar. Wow, what okay. varies that number so significantly is what we talked about at the beginning of this inventory management. If you, if you are over inventoried for the amount of volume that we're going to do in the sale. Now, Jim has a lot of, had a lot of inventory, but he was efficient with his inventory. He didn't just have three years worth of inventory laying around because he, he liked it. Um, but if the more, inventory that you have in excess of your capability to sell it, the capacity of the event reduces margins, reduces turn on investment. The less inventory that you have, the higher turn rate you can say that the store owner gets, the better that we can control the margin and get a higher sell through on it. So to answer, answer the customer's question, it's $1.25, $1.27 over the overall average. Um, but it's very store specific to what exactly you're going to end up with at the end of the day. Okay. I thought, I thought the answer might be something along that lines, but I just wanted to ask. Um, thanks again so much, Josh and Jim. This was a really inter interesting discussion. And thanks to Brecken for hosting today. And of course, thank you to all our audience members who joined us. Um, my next question will return next Tuesday, August 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Michelle Graff will be sitting down, me, will be sitting down with three published authors, Marion Faisal, Rob Bates, and Bill Boyajan to talk about uh, how they write, when they write, and what's next for them in terms of publishing books. Uh, you can sign up to attend that webinar on our site. I've just dropped the link into the chat. Um, and thank you all for joining us today again, and please take care. <laughs>